Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for uh, our guests to arrive. Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for uh, our guests to arrive. We'll just give it another minute. I still see people coming in. Takes just a minute to get everybody into the, the seminar. So uh, we'll just give it another minute. Well, welcome and good morning. My name is Leslie Evans, Executive Director with the Friends of the Federation of Calgary Community. Our organization has supported this event along with the assistance of the Calgary Foundation. Before we begin, and in the spirit of respect, reciprocity and truth, we honor and acknowledge that we're on the traditional territories in Alberta of the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Today, I'm joining you from Mokinstis and the traditional Treaty 7 territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siseka, the Kainai, the Pekini, as well as the Iskia, Nakoda, and Tusina nations. We acknowledge that this, is ter this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, and within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. Finally, we acknowledge all nations, indig Indigenous and non, who live, work, and play, and help us steward this land, honor, and celebrate this territory. We all belong here, and I welcome you all to get to know your government municipal. I'd also like to take this moment to wish you a happy Neighbor Day. Finally, please note that our webinar today is being recorded. It will be available on our YouTube channel. It's also being live streamed right now on the Federation of Calgary Communities YouTube channel. It is now my pleasure to introduce the principal organizer of this event and community volunteer, Lucy. Welcome, Lucy. Good morning. Thank you, Leslie. My name is Lucy Alano, and I'm the treasurer for the Cliff Bangalore Mission Community Association. As an organization, we approach the Federation to partner on hosting a workshop to help the general public learn more about how our government works. We hope that, or our goal for this session is that at the end of it, not only will we enhance your knowledge about how government works, but also that we will inspire you to actively participate in your community and to engage uh, your elected officials on issues that matter. So welcome everyone. We're excited to introduce you to our facilitator, Paul Ferry. But before I do that, I would like to go over a few house, housekeeping items. This is an education workshop, so no partisan questions will be entertained. There will be four sessions. Please use your chat function to ask your questions or the Q&A um, option. We will try to curate as many questions as possible and respond to as many as possible within the allotted time. Your videos and mics will remain off during the whole presentation. I would like to talk about our facilitator, Paul Ferry. Paul Ferry has a PhD in political science and is a senior research associate at the University of Calgary. He teaches politics for the continuing education department. In 2019, he served as the city of Calgary tax assessment working group, looking at the province, at the municipal property tax system. It is my pleasure to introduce to you, Paul Ferry. Thanks so much, uh, Leslie and Lucy. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for coming and, and a big happy Neighbor Day 
uh, to you all. So I'm going to just share my screen here. There we go. So welcome uh, to uh, Get to Know Your Government uh, Municipal, um, which is, uh, as, as Lucy and Leslie said, supported by all of these generous people um, here. So today we've broken up today into just to four kind of simple parts. First, we'll talk about what municipal government does. Then we'll talk about some important city issues. Then we'll talk about uh, the October 18th election, I should say the 18th, and then um, how you can get uh, how you can get more involved. So the structure will basically be, I'll explain something quickly, and then we'll bring on a guest to talk about it a little bit more. And then hopefully we'll, we'll get some questions uh, from all of you. So we hope that sounds good to you because it's what we plan. So that's sort of uh, what we'll do. So part one, what does the municipal government do? So definitely a, a, definitely a good question. So essentially what we're asking then is like, what, what powers does the municipal government have? So big picture for a second. Uh, in Canada, government powers are outlined in the constitution. Uh, definitely something to, to give a look uh, at some point. But if you look at section 91, you can see all the, most of the federal powers and section 92 outlines most of the provincial powers. So in section 91, which outlines what the federal government does, you see all the different lists of things much longer than this, defense, the regulation of trade, citizenship, usually not that relevant, but very relevant right now, quarantine, uh, criminal law. There's, there's a long list that you can look at. Section 92 then outlines the provincial powers. So what are the, what are the provinces in charge of according to the constitution? Things like hospitals, education, natural resources. My very favorite um, word in the constitution, elimo signery, which is just a good uh, party, party uh, fact for people, but then it just means charity. It's the best, uh, uh, the best word in the constitution. But then the question is, what about municipalities? Where do they fit into all of this? So it's not really like, it's not just in section 93. Where that is, is actually in section 92 of the constitution, subsection eight, uh, everyone's favorite. Uh, it says, uh, provinces are in charge of municipal institutions in the province. So what does that, um, so what does that mean? So it basically means that the powers of the cities in, in Canada and in Alberta are, are essentially provincial responsibilities. So the province uh, is the one that is um, in charge of defining what cities get to do. So each province then has a different act in, um, in, 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 its, uh, in its law. So, I mean, uh, BC will have one, Alberta will have one. So in Alberta, we have the Municipal Government Act. So for Calgary, all of the powers of the city are defined uh, in the Municipal Government Act. So what are they? So again, there's a, there's a list, but we can break it down to this. So it's about the safety, health, and welfare of the people, the protection of people and property, sort of anything to do with public spaces or land use, uh, transportation, the operation of businesses, uh, city services uh, and public utilities, uh, wild and domestic animals, uh, as well as bylaw enforcement. So when we are looking at the election, say this fall, what we're really interested in doing then is, is picking people who can uh, decide what we want to do about these areas uh, for the city of Calgary. So another way to look at the powers of cities is just to look at where the city gets its money and how it spends its money. So this isn't thousands of dollars, otherwise the city would be quite small. Um, you can see about half of the city's revenues comes from property taxes of various kinds. Another billion comes from the sales of various goods and services, 300 million from uh, government transfers to the city, and various other uh, bits of income as well, investment income, equity from only NMAX, that sort of thing. In terms of what it does, you can see here that earlier list that I looked at from the Municipal Government Act about the responsibility of the cities, you can see what we spend our money on then. So a, a big chunk of our, the, the, the budget is spent on, on the protection of uh, people and property. So the police and fire essentially make up quite a, quite a large portion of the budget. Transportation, so that's not just uh, public transit, the sea train buses and so on, but it's also all about uh, roads and traffic and parking uh, as well. So that's another large portion of the budget. All of the sort of 
what we might think of as like basic, super essential infrastructure. So uh, water services, waste, recycling, environmental services, another large chunk of the, the budget. And then the final one is, is sort of about uh, community and cultural services and sort of the more sort of general uh, government costs. So when we look at what the city spends its money on, not surprisingly, it comes out of the, the priorities from uh, outlined in the Municipal Government Act. But another unusual thing to think about just while we're talking about budgets in the city um, municipal politics context is that in Alberta, also all across the country, uh, the various municipal government acts uh, basically by law mandate that municipalities have to have balanced operating budgets. So basically the amount of revenue that we bring in and assign to the operating budget has to be uh, you know, greater than or equal to the amount of money that we spend. So that's very different from uh, provincial or uh, federal levels of budget. So you, you will hear about these two types of budgets, the operating budget and also the capital budget. So the operating budget is all of our ongoing annual expenses. The capital budget is for sort of larger scale projects. So again, in, in city politics, we have to sort of balance out these two things, the revenues and the expenses. So essentially because it is uh, mandated uh, by law. So who gets to decide these things? This is you know, a responsibility of, of the mayor and council. So in Calgary, we have a council of 15 people, one mayor, 14 councillors. <clears throat> and in Alberta, defined again in the Municipal Government Act, which, I mean, I don't recommend reading the whole thing. It's a little bit long, but it's worth a, it's worth a skim at the very least. But in that act, the mayor and council essentially have quite similar roles, as much as the mayor will seem more prominent. Uh, they, they, they don't have a terribly larger number of, of powers than uh, councillors for uh, the various wards. This is what's called a, a weak mayor system. That's not a, a statement about uh, the mayor's physical strength or anything, but it, but it is just one way of setting up um, municipal governments around the world. The other one, is, you might guess, is called the strong mayor system, where the, where the mayor has you know, uh, extra powers on top of council. But in Alberta, most, mostly across Canada as well, we've decided that mayors are um, roughly equivalent to councillors in terms of uh, their power. They often have larger office budgets, certainly do in Calgary. They often have, you know, they sit on extra committees and so on, but it's not, it's not a hugely, a hugely different role. So overall, just thinking about what does the city government do? So the city government does whatever is defined in the provincial municipal government act. So that does mean that the, the province has a lot of power uh, when it comes uh, to cities. And the city then generally is in charge of what we might think of as local matters. So the big ones are, you know, land use. What, what do we put where? How do we use the land that we have here? Um, transportation, how do we get around? Protective services, how do we protect the people and, and, and property? And all of the really essential and basic infrastructure, water, garbage, this sort of thing. Third, the city has to do all of this in the context of a balanced operating budget. And then the mayor and council are, are really the, the main 15 people who sort of decide, to decide on the, the vision of how we want to, um, how we want to enact all of these uh, powers. So now I'm really um, happy to welcome, I think I saw him somewhere on the list, uh, Councillor Evan Woolley, who's the, the councillor from, from my ward currently actually, uh, in Ward 8. So uh, if, if we have, you all stop sharing the screen. Leslie, I think you might be in the attendees list. He's actually here. I'm yeah, wondering, Councillor Willie, are you able to turn your video on? Yeah, I didn't see him in the panelist list. I just see him in the attendees list for some reason. I wonder if he got moved back. Just a second, we'll, we'll try again here. Uh, it, you know, what would be a Zoom meeting without a small glitch like this? Oh, I know. It's, uh, <laughs> we've all become uh, part-time IT people as well, I think, right now. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 
Um, I believe he is uh, signing as a guest and perhaps he's not able to activate his video. Okay, Councillor Woolley, can you hear us? Can you talk to us? There Hello. he is. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, I was starting to sweat that, you guys. <laughs> but we knew you were there. We just said uh, you have to figure out which buttons to press all at once. But but thanks so much, uh, Councillor Woolley, for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. That was a really great, uh, great and concise introduction to the work that we do. Yes, yeah, it's a little bit hard to to our powers. Yes, yes. It's a little bit hard to rush through it in about eight minutes, but I, I, I tried my best. So I guess obviously a reason that we have you here is uh, you're, you're currently serving as a, as a city councillor on city council. So, so maybe just the most general question in the world, do you want to talk about how you got involved in local politics and then your impressions of uh, your role as a councillor? Yeah, for sure. So, um, I mean, I grew up with politics uh at the dinner table and um i it, it public community service and public service were a big part of my family growing up uh as like an, as like one of those core expectations um and as a philosophy of participating in in our community in your community and the importance uh, uh of community and 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 had like high expectations as a kid my mom also so owned uh, my mom's also owned the largest daycare center in the city for about 15 years and that daycare uh, uh, was actually in the middle of the foothills industrial park and so it was kind of like this really massively large family uh, and small community that I grew up in and 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 being the, the son of the daycare owner there was kind of a different role for me uh, as a child amongst peers in the daycare. And so I think like, I really kind of think that it was that structure of growing up that played a really, really important uh, role in, in why I'm here today. Um, I was never very good at school. I, I got terrible grades. <laughs> and I, uh, but I was always really involved in everything at school. I don't know if anybody's seen the movie uh, Rushmore, the Wes Anderson movie. Um, it's, it was, that was kind of me growing up and uh and so I, I kind of got involved slowly. Um, I was uh, through university really involved, came, ended up back in Calgary uh, in about 2006. And I joined the Cliff Bungalow Mission Community Association Board. And I was living in, uh, in, in Cliff Bungalow. I was born, in, born, in, born at the Holy Cross Hospital, actually, and, and kind of got involved in community and neighborhood uh, heritage and environment and all sorts of different things. I was also involved in Sled Island Music Festival. Hmm and was one of the founders of Sled Island uh, with Zach Pacek and a number of others and was just involved in kind of the Beltline and the community indie rock music scene and um, participated in, in politics in, in kind of that level and, and thought that we weren't getting good representation um, and uh, a very small group of us who were politically engaged uh, took a very long shot run and worked super, super hard and uh, kind of were the upset of the 20, uh, 2013 municipal election. Uh, nobody, it, nobody really saw it coming, and 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 here I am. And uh, it, it's it's obviously a, a longer story than that, but um, uh, it 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 is uh, it has, and I'm on my way out the door, so I am at this kind of reflective moment in mm -hmm. in my role in politics right now. But it has been an incredible um, opportunity. To govern because I, I what I've actually realized more is, is I, I, I like politics particularly less these days um, but have have uh, have enjoyed governance uh, incredibly over over the last eight years and um, you know uh, I'm the chair of the city of Calgary's audit committee and so it was mm -hmm. nice to see those numbers put up um, <clears throat> which which the joke on council is, is you don't get any votes by being on audit committee and I've been the chair of audit committee for six years now and it is, it is the roll up your sleeves, lean in governance of this city that I have uh, been profoundly impacted uh, by and, and, and like to think that I have impacted on. So that was a bit of a long winded answer to that question. Oh no, oh, no. It's, it's, it's great to hear that story. So, I mean, maybe one more question from me and then we'll turn it over to, um, to the audience. Um, yeah. Just like, the, the actual day-to-day -day workings of, of being on council? Like, you know, what, what would be a, a, the two-minute tour of, of that world? 
Yeah, I mean, it's this thing that particularly in this last term uh, has seemed extra divisive, not only in, in city council politics, but but in, in Western democracies. Um, but that the vast majority of us uh, get along, work together every single day. And I always use the example of, of, of Peter DeMong. And Councillor DeMong um, and I have shared on an office wall where he throws these stupid tennis balls uh, when he's on phone skates, but have shared an office wall for eight years and have become close, quite close. And Councillor DeMong and I, uh, you know, very often do not vote on the same things. Um, but there is the job of governance, which is, he, he's an incredible government uh, governor. Um, you have to work to, to, you have to work together every day to keep the lights on. And, you know, there are a, a number, you know, very few, a very small number of councillors who just think that the job is politics, but you have to run committees, you have to give direction, you have to write motions, you have to participate in the AUMA, you have to work at the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, you have to run the audit committee, right, you have to pass budgets, you need to provide direction to administration and leadership and um, it's an incredibly, uh, incredibly big amount of work, but the, the vast majority of us get along. Uh, we eat lunch together. We eat a lot of food together um, because we spend so much time together, which is why in the, in, the, in the summers we just disappear. I never I don't want to see Peter tomorrow. In August, <laughs> but, um, it, 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 it is uh, it is, uh, again, a fab, a fabulous uh, uh, position, a super privileged position. Uh, but a very difficult one. Uh, we are we are going through. When I was elected, Paul, I remember when I was elected in October of 2013, oil was at 136 bucks a barrel, and I kind of thought that this was just like I remember get, getting to go to some events and cut some with some shovels and, and and break some ground and cut some ribbons, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is just like the greatest easiest job. Ever. <laughs> and very very quickly. Uh, we've we you know we saw a, a major structural shift in our economy and a significant under uh, a, a, a significant change in the social, economic and environmental um, um, uh, uh, realities that, that and challenges that we're facing right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm want, wondering, Leslie and Lucy, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, actually, we have a, a question about. What was your biggest success or disappointment? Hmm. You know, I guess, that, I mean, there's a couple of different ways that I could think about that. Um, um, you know, one of, one of the, one of the big bit, one of the big little successes, and this is like more of a, 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 a maybe not a, just a political success, but a really tiny one, but a really important step for us. Uh, was the cycle tracks um, that was done in my first term early on uh, when I think of it in the scale and I always get I get quite annoyed we spent an exorbitant amount of time and energy on a very small five million dollar uh, project right we have 105 lanes for of, of, of vehicular traffic in the downtown and, and we needed to take we, we asked to take four of those lanes for five million bucks and the amount of energy that we spent but it was an important uh, an, a really important step for, for our city. And I think was a really important one for me po politically in the communities that I represent because so much of the, of the, uh, of the transportation network in our city is set up to pump people into and out of downtown with complete disregard for the, for the people that live in the community, a lot of the communities that I represent. And that was when the other, the other win is, is, was our general stewardship through this difficult time. And I know, I know we continue to face challenges, um, but the city of Calgary is an incredibly well-run company. And I think one of, uh, one of my proudest things, and it is not a voter thing, but that, that we have stewarded our city uh, um, um, very, very well through some very difficult times. And those difficult times are by no means over. I, I think we have, um, uh, some challenge, some big, big uh, challenges ahead of us. But um, that, those are probably my biggest, uh, my biggest disappointments. I think, I think some of them are the <clears throat> probably around the tone and tenor of politics. And I, I and I guess I've, I've disappointed myself because it's easy to get dragged down into that. Um, but, but, but overall, I, I, I really wish um, that particularly this last council was a bit more able to publicly represent ourselves uh, 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 better. And, and then I think probably one of my biggest kind of 
failures is I didn't spend enough time on, on environmental issues in my eight years in office. And, and it was not, it was not, um, it was not unintentional. Uh, when I look at the landscape of the things that you can accomplish and where your power sits and where you're going to spend your time and energy, I just, I, 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 I didn't spend enough time and I'm disappointed in that. I wish, I wish I had had more time and, and, and focused a bit more on environmental issues and issues related to climate change, uh, but I didn't. Yeah, Councillor Woolley, there's, there's many questions coming in. Um, I, I, they're all different. So I'm going to give you <laughs> one um, that it's related to your comment and, and to try and help people. It, your comments about transcending politics is enlightening. And how does someone determine which of the potential mayor or uh, councillor candidates will be able to do that? How, how do they decide? You know, it, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. And um, uh, particularly given um, that certain um, that 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 certain certain pe certain components of our community <clears throat> are very very effective at spreading misinformation, uh, the machine that 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 misinformation machine that is out there uh, is, is run very effectively, and. Um, uh, I think uh, mainstream media, I know that Darren is here, but I think that the Calgary Herald and the Calgary Sun have been champions of that. Um, and I think that that has made it very, very difficult for us to have this uh, a more, a more, um, a better, a better tone and narrative coming from council. The other thing is, and, 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 and I have a ton, a ton of time uh, and respect and friendship for, for the mayor, but the mayor, and it was a part of his own governing philosophy, right? Was really to let people be who they are and to provide, um, provide uh, the soapbox that we have as members of council. And he, and he was, he, he has been very reluctant to use his power as the chair. So, well, well, he's, he's not physically a weak mayor uh, and the system isn't, you know, the mayor mayoral system is weak. He still is the chair of council and him and I have, had long conversations about his willingness to allow people to take to to take their the, that platform and to use it, and 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 it, and it is a philosophy of his that he believes really deeply in, and 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 that the big conversation is there. And so, I know that that was like maybe not the best answer and a bit wa a bit wandering, but I have not figured it out. Um, and and I can tell you that if you take uh, all 12 members of council, there were times, uh, you guys, when we were so exacerbated uh, by our inability to effectively, and we had, you know, at, at the dinner table, it was, uh, it was, there were there have been long frustrated conversations about uh, how unfortunate it is, especially given how well we all work together, despite all of our very, very different uh, uh, opinions and positions. <laughs> I have another question. Oh, yeah, I mean, I have many. Um, how do the priorities of the political party in power, so I'm assuming we're talking about provincial and federal, uh, or in this one it's provincial, affect municipal appointments? Municipal appointments. That's the question. Can you just repeat that? I, I understand yeah. most of that up, in, up until the municipal appointments piece. How do the uh, priorities of the political party in power in the provincial government affect yeah. municipal appointments? I, I, I'd be interested in Paul, if you're reading that the same way I am. I don't think they really do. Um, I mean, maybe just broaden it to municipal politics, even. Sure. Yeah, that yeah, might be yeah. a better no, 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 way. No, step back. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, the, 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 we, we make all sorts of appointments, but yeah, I'll, I'll just step back and take a broader shot at it. I mean, you know, it's been so fascinating because we've seen all within my time in government. When, when was the provincial NDP first elected in 20, 2015? 2015, yeah, 2015. Yeah. And so I saw in my eight years, I saw the PCs fall after, I think it was 47 years or some incredible amount of time, the NDP come in and govern for four years and now the UCP. And so, it has been really interesting to watch. And it's been interesting to watch also in the context of how it influences political or uh, municipal uh, politics. And, and, you know, it's, it really is an interesting thing that I've watched, particularly in the last year, which is, I think you, you saw a lot of mayoral candidates 
uh, and, and potential mayoral candidates and even council after after Premier Kenny was elected kind of take this bank to the right. The, the, the provincial UCP won, I think, about 75 percent of the vote in Calgary, a really, really big number. Um, and you saw this kind of, uh, you know, this clambering in municipal politics and uh, in the can kind of the mayoral jockeying bank really right. And in the last year, you have just seen I, I, there is this massive vacuum in progressive and moderate uh, political positions and, 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 and in mayoral candidates. I mean, you see Councillor Farkas and Councillor Davison and Councillor Gondekt all really, uh, I think, kind of pivoting to this big open space uh, in moderate and progressive politics because uh, the provincial government is, is, is well, I'm, and, and absolutely rightly so, so deeply unpopular right now um uh through through covid but I, I don't know if that kind of makes sense or kind of answers that question Evan, but, i i want to just i know we're pressed for time the word okay. was actually not appointments it was apportionments um i misread so i assume like transfers uh, so and municipal <laughs> apportionments um <laughs> does that make sense now so i'm sure sorry. i mean that's just you know that that's the uh you know uh you know, so much of our budget comes from uh, government transfers, right? Particularly as it relates to capital. Well, almost, you know, exclusively as it relates to capital. Um, you know, we, uh, a couple of things. One, for many, many years, and it's so funny to see the premier uh, rile on the federal government uh, around transfer payments and how we've got this like unfair, unfair uh, position in, in, in confederation. Uh, ironically, as like, you know, for, for decades, the city of Calgary sent more money to Edmonton by a long shot than they ever returned back. And uh, and and there was lots of griping over the over the years, pre even preceding me around that. Um, we've actually seen that even up quite a bit. The provincial government has backed out of uh, a lot of the, um, the property tax over the years, uh, particularly related to how they pay for schools and what have you. Um, and uh, uh, and that and that score is kind of evened up, so it's a little less uneven than it used to be, particularly actually in COVID. <clears throat> and so all of these people that are talking about like the, the provinces, you know, we're sending more money to the province than they send back. Actually, in the last two years, uh, it's it, it, it's not the case. Um, the other really unfortunate uh, uh, thing that happened uh, was that um, as we as we negotiated and signed the city charter. Uh, there was the knock on uh, fiscal framework, which was really supposed to lay out um, stable long term funding agreements between the provincial, provincial governments in Edmonton and Calgary. And the, you know, the NDP government um, signed, uh, I think, what was not enough. Uh, and it was a, a weak fiscal framework, uh, which was disappointing. But then uh, Premier Kenny has basically chucked that fiscal framework into the garbage can. Um, and again, this comes down to these 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 powers that we are really we do not exist. Cities, the city of Calgary does not exist, but for the municipal uh, governance government act, and um, we are the children of of the province. And and you know, doesn't matter how many agreements you can have signed, they really have incredible powers not to see those agreements through. And um, it will, you know, it, it has been it has it has been a massive challenge for municipalities across Canada. And I and I doubt that it will uh, it will fix itself out any any time uh, too soon um, without like significant constitutional reform actually. So so maybe we have I think we do actually have time for one last question. And uh, was yes. there one more you want to highlight? And then yes, yeah. Okay, one last question. Um, how can citizens best have their voice heard by the mayor and council? How can citizens have their voice heard by the mayor and council? Yes. Yeah, you know what? And I, I, uh, I, uh, I guess my answer to that would be they do. Um, you know, I, I, I have I received an email uh, from a constituent that I I, I read uh, yesterday afternoon. I'm going to call them on uh, on Monday um, uh, because it was a really really thoughtful email, but um, but it kind of stated that we don't and. Uh, I kind of, I, I, I disagree with it, but it was such a well-written email. I was like, I got to have this conversation with this person. I may, might even make it an outside coffee or something like that, because I think there is this, there is a, an incredible amount of engagement that we do on almost every single issue. Um, uh, the city of Calgary spends an exorbitant amount of money. We have one of the most open and transparent 
budgeting processes in, in the world. Um, on every land use decision and development permit decision, there is incredible opportunities to engage people engaged through their community associations. Our administration spends an, ex an exorbitant amount of time and resources. And again, not just listening or talking to, but actually decision-making and governing, right? I, I remember when I was on my community association uh, in Cliff Bungalow for years, it was fantastic. And I think it remains fantastic. The difference comes when, uh, when someone doesn't agree with the decision uh, or a position that you take. And, um, you know, and again, particularly this has come up in my communities. I mean, one of the things that I think I've benefited from, which is uh, I, I'm, I'm of and from the neighborhoods that I represent, right? Uh, they're, they're, you know, I was born in Ward 8 in 1980. I live my life here. Uh, I'm deeply embedded in the community, not just as a part of my job, but as a part of my life. And um, I take that engagement really, really seriously. Um, but I also think we were elected to make decisions. And, and, and when I first got elected, my, I, I said to my wife, and she was just shocked by it, that I said, I'm going to have to get pretty comfortable with one in three people disliking me. <laughs> and that's a weird thing. And my wife thought it was so weird because everybody loves my wife. She just couldn't imagine like she like one in three. Oh, my God, that's a lot of people disliking you. But we're elected to make decisions and, and we have to make decisions. And um, and in living in a city, in a ward that I represent with so many different um, uh, positions, opinions, socioeconomic demographics and the like, uh, it's, it's an impossible task. But uh, I think the city and I, well, I, I don't think I, I, I know the city does a very good job in engaging citizens on a wide breadth of issues uh, deeply and often. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much, uh, Councillor Woolley. So there are a few more questions in the, the Q&A portion, I think you might see at the bottom. So if there's any you want to address just by text that okay. uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they'd appreciate that. But we will sure. uh, move on to section two. But thanks again for, for chatting this morning. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. That was fun. Thanks. So I will go back to sharing my screen. Here we go. So uh, part two, uh, let's just think about some of the issues um, that will come up as the result of, um, well, I mean, as a result of living in the city of Calgary, really, um, that are particularly to do uh, uh, with municipal governance here. So, I mean, obviously, like, what's the most important issue? It's, it's, it's a question sometimes I get asked, and I'm sure lots of people um, get asked as well. But And that obviously really depends on your own personal values, what you prioritize from what, what you want out of the, the city and the community. Um, but there are definitely a few common themes that emerge once you start uh, uh, down the, the path of uh, paying um, too much attention to, to municipal politics. Uh, sometimes I feel like I do. Um, but the, the common topics that always come up Things like property taxes, how best to pay for the city, how to do it equitably and fairly. And I'll talk a little bit about the downtown tax shift as an issue. Um, we'll talk, uh, transportation always comes up. Right now, the Green Line is probably the big dominating discussion, but things like um, the Ring Road and all, all sorts of other transportation issues are always uh, around land use planning, the basic decisions about what we do uh, with our land. It's always uh, really controversial if you remember uh, pardon me, a couple of years ago, uh, secondary suites were, were sort of uh, all the, the rage in terms of um, people talking about what to do uh, with that. And more recently, the debate around the guidebook for great communities uh, really always comes up as well. Um, if, if, you, if you journey down the road to reading about municipal politics too much, you do end up reading a lot of land use documents. And finally, I, I put this here as it's basically the perfect uh, municipal issue, parking. Why? Because it's sort of a combination of like, what do we do with land? And it has to do with transportation. And it really also even has to do with um, property taxes uh, as well. So I'll, I'll kind of very quickly sort of lead us through a little bit of a, a think session uh, about some of these. And then uh, we'll talk to uh, our guest uh, about uh, what he sees as uh, some of the most important issues. So property taxes um, are a main way that the city generates the revenue from the chart that we looked at at the beginning, really simply put, it's sort of the market value assessment of various properties around the city, residential and commercial, multiplied by the, the mill rate, the, the property tax uh, rate. And it's quite different from income taxes. If you think about income taxes, 
you sort of pay them a little bit retrospectively, but at the end of the year, you like you file your taxes and you can get a refund or not. Uh, but property taxes is sort of essentially a bill. So it's, it's quite a different um, uh, theme there. Um, so in terms of pros, uh, for the city, it's actually a pretty predictable source of revenue because again, it's sort of more like a bill. Whereas if you remember, I mean, <laughs> we're even in the midst of uh, COVID where a lot of people's incomes uh, decrease very rapidly, they end up dropping the amount of income taxes that they pay uh, over the year. Whereas with property taxes, it's, 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 it's a lot more predictable. The city government knows essentially what it's going to uh, receive. The cons of property taxes, especially compared to income taxes, not super connected to your uh, ability to pay. So th there's often a debate about um, property taxes. An important fact, though, about property tax system is that it's a revenue neutral property tax system. That's a specific word. But it's, uh, and what that really means is that the reassessment of your property itself doesn't change the overall amount of taxes uh, that you pay by itself. So, I mean, if you think of income taxes, if your income goes up, you pay more income taxes. But for property taxes, it's, it's the relative change of your property's value versus the property values of, uh, of your neighbors. So basically, if everybody's property values doubled tomorrow, the city wouldn't magically collect twice as much money. They would just decrease the property tax rate in order to balance that uh, out. Similarly, if your property value goes up a little bit, but everybody else's property value drops a lot, then you might end up paying quite, quite a bit more uh, compared to last year, even if you think, oh, my, my property value hasn't changed all that much. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different kind of system. And if we're thinking about big issues, and this is the one I personally think about, but I mean, obviously your, your mileage may vary, is, is this I, uh, discussion around the downtown tax shift. So this is part of the work that I did for the, the tax shift assessment uh, working group. So if you look at the property values in the city of Calgary, and this is a map I stole from Twitter, uh, this is like the heights of the little, uh, I don't know what they are, cones here or uh, cylinders, uh, are how much property values are, um, how, how much properties are valued across the city. And you can see there's a huge spike right in the middle of the city. It's really just because of like the, the downtown office towers, the larger apartment buildings and condos really have an intensely much higher uh, value than properties throughout the rest of the city. So basically what that means is especially in good boom times, uh, downtown uh, properties are covering a lot of the um, property tax uh, responsibility uh, that needs to be uh, assigned to people. But what's happened in the last few years, these are some tweets I stole from Tra Trevor Toome, an economist at the University of Calgary. Um, worth a follow if, you, if you're on Twitter. And you can see here, like some buildings have really lost a lot of value all of a sudden. So the bow, the, the, the big one with the head and the ground, um, was worth $1.4 billion in 2015. In, in 2019, it was worth $775 million. So what that means for the city is there's now a $12 million hole that you have to, to cover by sort of spreading it out across the rest of the city. Similarly, Bow Valley Square, another building, another $12 million gone for the city. Eighth Avenue Place, which is right near where I live, um, another $7 million uh, from the city, just because of the, 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 the cratering of, of property values uh, downtown. And I'll, I'll show you a little example, um, and you can ask more questions about it uh, in, in, in the Q&A portion. But imagine if you had $5,000 of property in this fictional city, just nine properties. So there's one big building in the middle worth 3,000, sort of spread out around the outer properties as well. So how does the revenue neutral tax system work? So let's say for the $5,000 of property value, you wanted to raise 50 bucks to cover all of your spending. So what that means is you have to raise one penny for each $1 of the valuation of each property. Multiplication, super simple here. That's why I chose the numbers. Um, you can see here what the tax bills would be for each of these nine properties. Now let's just say then the middle property decreases in value, goes from $3,000 to $2,000, very similar to what happened to the Bow building or Bow Valley Square, but uh, all the buildings really um, downtown. But all of the properties around it didn't change in value, which is relatively what's happened uh, in much of Calgary as well. Now you still want to raise the same 50 bucks to cover your operations for this fictional city. So now you have to cover uh, like 1.25 cents uh, of, of property tax for every dollar in value. 
So you can see what the property uh, tax uh, bills would be for each of these properties. Now I'll flip back and forth. You can see here the top left-hand corner pays $1 in tax in the old valuation, now pays 25% more. $1.25, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but 25% more, even though their property valuation hasn't changed at all. So that's, that's essentially what the revenue neutral tax system does. And you can see how a drop in values in this, um, in a city that's structured like Calgary, with a lot of the value uh, concentrated downtown, will lead to a tax shift that ends up occurring because of the way that the property tax system is set up. So essentially, in terms of, of issues, this is, this is one uh, I, I'd certainly recommend uh, to pay attention to. Now, a couple of other quick ones that we'll do before we talk to Darren. Um, the guidebook for great communities is something that you might have heard. So there was a, an interesting debate if you were following it. Some community members felt like they weren't engaged in the process or that they were uh, afraid that it would bring in sweeping changes, while others supported the guidebook and felt like the changes were maybe more uh, moderate. Generally, what the discussion was about was providing structure to land, uh, local area plans across the city uh, to guide this important issue that we talked about, land use planning decisions. Ultimately, they sort of took away some of the power from the, um, the document. But just in terms of paying attention to local issues, it was a great example of, of how important and how um, central land use decisions are to city politics. And also, it was a really interesting example of how some communities were able to really organize opposition and even support uh, for the guidebook, um, but they were able to really influence the debate as a result of um, some organizing at the local community level. The Green Line as well, if you're paying attention, if you remember right at the beginning when we talked, uh, the Municipal Government Act and the province has a lot of power over the city. It's another example of how the, the city is really powerful when it, while well, the province is really powerful when it comes to uh, municipal governments, because under the, the capital budget, as Councillor Woolley said, uh, it relies a lot on transfers from other levels of government. Uh, so the provincial government uh, would be responsible for paying for one third of the green line. And you can see how local decisions like whether or not to have a green line aren't entirely local decisions. They also depend on, on the, the provincial government in Edmonton, on even the federal government as well uh, in Ottawa. So you've got to be aware of some of the power dynamics. Another issue, which I definitely can't do justice to, is sort of the idea of truth and reconciliation. A lot of people have been talking about it over the, the last few weeks, although we should always be, always be thinking about this. And if you're wondering what role the city has to play um, in figuring out the uh, appro appropriate and respectful way of, um, of, of, of dealing with the findings of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I'd really recommend reading the, the White Goose Flying Report. This is a report, you can Google it, it's quite easy to find. Um, uh, it's the city's response uh, to um, what the city of Calgary can do and, and municipal uh, politics can do in order to, to, to achieve some of the aims of the, of the TRC. So really, just to conclude, local politics is always exciting, but it's really the same kinds of issues that we talk about. What should we do with the land that we have? How should we get around the city? How can we protect ourselves? How are we going to pay for it? And really, ultimately, it's the main question of what do we want our community to be like? So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and invite Darren Krause to come, come join us. Hi, Paul. Hey, Darren. How are you? I'm great, thank you. Thanks for joining us. So yeah. I guess I'll, 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 I'll give you an equally uh, general question and see where this goes. What would, <laughs> what would you say are the, the big issues uh, for the city right now? Uh, well, it's, it's really interesting, I guess, to, to contextualize it. Um, we're talking four months out from the municipal election. And really the issues that might be hot today that we might be talking about, you know, like the guidebook for great communities or something like that, or, uh, you know, let's say uh, taxation or, or those sorts of things, they may not be as hot button when we get to the beginning of October. So, but through the, some of the conversations that I've had, uh, and you touched on it early, um, was not everyone sees things the same way. And, and your, what issues are important to you are very much based on your values. But what I've heard in talking with 
numerous candidates and uh, numerous citizens is, uh, interestingly, the top issue that I hear is the one that the city, depending on the way you look at it, may have the least control over, and that's the economy. Um, we want to see uh, how Calgary emerges, not only from the downturn in the oil, uh, but also from, from COVID. Obviously, that's had a devastating effect on economies overall. But I think, you know, the city plays a large role in uh, creating the environment for, uh, for a, th a thriving economy. Um, obviously, it controls uh, the taxation, which you had covered there, uh, but it also controls, you know, the, the regulations around operating a business in, in a city. So, so creating an environment, I think, uh, where Calgary can emerge from not only the oil and gas, but the COVID situation, is uh, I think is a real top issue on people's minds going into the municipal election. Um, the next one uh, I would say is, is taxation. And really the conversation around this has shifted in the past number of years. When I first started covering municipal politics, um, this was back in the day, uh, you know, when, when Dave Broncagne, Rick McIver were there and it was a lot about even just any specific increase in uh, taxation. And while that is still an issue for a lot of people, I think what's become a bigger issue now for people is those wild swings that we've seen over the past, uh, you know, four or five years, uh, you know, going from, from a certain property tax to seeing that 25%, which you so clearly illustrated. For a lot of small business owners who have been particularly impacted, that's a massive hit to their business. And I think what many people would like to see is uh, city council focus on, and I know it takes a lot of work with the, with the province, but to focus on a way to maybe flatten out some of those fluctuations a little bit. Uh, and I think that'll be a big thing that people talk about this municipal election. But also when we talk about taxation, I think what citizens want to hear and want to see is that the city is spending the dollars in a way that reflects their values. Um, I think there's a growing number of people who recognize, okay, yes, we got to pay property taxes if we want safety, we want security, all those things that you talked about initially. But what we want to see is that it reflects the citizen values, not necessarily the values of of councillors per se, or city administration. They want to see that reflected in, in themselves. Uh, I know that Councillor Woolley had touched on this third one, uh, and that is the, the impression or the perception of civility on council. I've had a couple of interesting conversations with uh, both Mayor Nenshi and uh, Councillor Gondek on this because I asked him about civility on council. And, you know, Evan had pointed out as well that, you know, it, it generally speaking, they like each other and, and they can work with each other. Um, what we see on the council floor um, that is very much what the, the public perception is, is that it is a disagreement and it's, it's battles. And both Mayor Nenshi and Councillor Gondek have said, yeah, you know what, there's a little bit of theater uh, at council, but we get things done. Uh, so it's it. One might think that it's it's part of the the, the process, but I think people want to see uh, council working together, even if it's that that public appearance. They want to see that council is working together, whether it's by consensus or not. Um, you know, they want to see them working together for the betterment of the city. When they see that people are or that that respective councilors are specifically, you know, towing a certain political line or they are, um, they're, they're pushing what may be perceived as an agenda uh, and it conflicts in council. I think that's where citizens kind of take a step back and go, this council is not working for me. But along with that is, is a really interesting thing that's come up. I know that Evan also touched on this and it's the misinformation. Uh, there's, there's a lot of it out there and what it's done is it's created this level of distrust with not only city administration, but with city council. Um, and the trickle down effect of this trust issue is that now citizens 
can't trust each other to be able to have a conversation about many of these issues. Um, you know, one might support the bike lanes uh, and another person may not support the bike lanes, but there's, there's an inability today uh, to have a congenial conversation about the merits of having those but bike lanes or the merits of having a downtown strategy or the merits of the green line. It seems to be everybody's digging their heels in um, and that's kind of where we're locked in. And so it's, it's, it's created a, a real, uh, maybe a barrier to productive conversation in the city. Um, from there, I think that's when you start to get into the big ticket issues. Uh, you touched on a couple of them, Paul. The green line is obviously a big issue. It does very well de demonstrate that power dynamic between the city, uh, the province, and even the federal, the federal government. Um, and that's one that, that, that's ongoing. The arena issue, which I do believe is going to see some movement here in the very near future, uh, it's a it's a divisive issue. Um, there are people who say no public money, so that's that's always on people's radar as well. Um, the downtown strategy, how we're going to do this, whether it's the right strategy, whether you know repopulating the downtown with with neighborhoods. Uh, as opposed to businesses, uh, you know, there's some people who think it's a great idea, some people who don't. And then from there, I think what I'm hearing most is uh, a lot of talk about uh, the, the social aspect of, of where Calgary is going. Anti-racism, Indigenous relations, climate, and how, how any of these issues, because they're, they, they all have this lens applied to them, or they should have this lens applied to them. Uh, things uh, like the, the mental health and addiction as well. Um, when we talk about you know, defunding the police and, and you know, how that kind of works within the whole system, uh, I, I think those are also big issues. And maybe even though I've included them as, as kind of that, that final social category, those ones might actually end up being some of the bigger issues for the next city council moving forward. Yeah, no, no I mean, uh, really great analysis. I wonder, Leslie and Lucy, uh, do we have any questions from the, the audience? Well, thank you, Darren. Um, I know your online publication, Livewire, is excellent. And, and I'm posting a link to that uh, right now in the chat for everyone. We have some great question. Uh, mm -hmm. First one pertaining to tax, and I'm not sure, or, or our funding model here in the city of Paul or Darren are the best person for this. But the question um, is really about the notion that our city might have an outdated funding model, uh, which is solely dependent on property taxes. Are there other examples we can draw from uh, that might be more innovative in terms of how we fund our city? Paul's probably better suited to this. I did a little bit of research on this because I asked the same question myself. Um, some cities have models that are more more based, very similar to uh, to your your income tax, their their payroll taxes, and they're kind of applied to to businesses based on the the size of their payroll, the you know, and and those sorts of things. Uh, so there's that. Um, that's probably the one that might be more frequently used. Uh, I believe it's actually used in Pittsburgh, who went in. Uh, a similar direction as, as, as Calgary is kind of going right now, where they had to reinvent themselves uh, from being a steel town, uh, at, you know, much like we have to reinvent ourselves from, from being an oil and gas town. But Paul, I'll kind of flip that one to you. Are there any other taxation models that work for municipalities? Yeah, so, so I mean, we, ha we have to look outside of Canada because um, Alberta is not unusual in terms of the structure, but essentially Calgary is limited by the Municipal Government Act, which, I, which we talked about at the beginning. When I, when I sat on the tax shift assessment working group, every time I came up with a brilliant idea, we'd look at the Municipal Government Act, we realized it wasn't possible, uh, and then move on with, with our day. Um, but yeah, so I mean, definitely the, the main key to all of this is just diversifying revenue sources, not even raising more revenue, just literally getting it from different places. Um, so, so you are right, like cities in the US have various different income streams. Some of them have uh, 
I don't want to bring up this word too much, but sales taxes. Uh, some of them have even uh, small income taxes uh, around the world. In the UK, there's different things that are similar to property taxes, but but do have a sort of a, a little bit of a different um, um, equity aspect uh, to them. So yeah, so I mean, ultimately without municipal uh, government act reform at the provincial level, and even honestly, potentially constitutional reform at the federal level, it, we, we, we are kind of really stuck to, to, to try and be, I would say, creative with, with some of the revenue streams. So I mean, given that context, I'd say things like generating more revenue from the services that we provide. I see Councillor Willie's- I, 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 wanted to, I wanted to pop in with one of the most controversial, but probably one of the things that if we're gonna, it, 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 if one of the big conversations that's happening is actually around road pricing. And that would be, um, that would be basically you pay a fee for every uh, kilometer trip used in your car. It is a political suicide uh, <laughs> today, but when we are thinking about the environment, and we're thinking about uh, a, a diverse revenue stream and thinking about actually where you live. If you are li if you are using the longest, you know, if you're if you're, you're driving your car and you're using the most amount of road every day, there's a price associated or there's a cost associated with that. And right now, one of the most heavily subsidized uh, forms of transportation is the single uh, single occupancy vehicle. Very controversial, though. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be brave enough to bring it up if I were right. <laughs> yeah. But I, I would say, though, like that, that is in the in the bigger bucket of basically the things that are fully subsidized by the city might we might need to revisit in terms of uh, what what cities are able to charge for them. Let me riff off that just a little bit, because that's an environmental uh, question as well. And I know one of Councillor Woolley's biggest regrets was uh, he didn't spend enough time, in his opinion, on the environment. And, and the next question is, what is the city's role in preventing and mitigating climate change? I'm not sure if that one is for me, but... Uh... From a journalist perspective, and, and when you see some of the city issues and the way that they're handled, uh, I believe whether it's uh, anti-racism, climate, uh, Indigenous relations, uh, or mental health and addictions, one of the things that the city um, is, is really starting to do, and they're starting to integrate it more, um, but Every time, it doesn't matter if it's a land use issue or if it's a transportation issue or if it's a, if it's a policing issue, I think that, that these layers need to be attached to all of those issues. And, and, and how does it impact? What is the potential impact? Right now, the city has their triple bottom line where they, they look at it through, through certain, they look at the issues through certain, um, certain criteria, um, but these ones aren't always included with everyone. While they may be, you know, as admin kind of goes through some of the issues, uh, the public doesn't actually see that impact. And I think you'll probably see it more and more. Um, and you're starting to see, especially the climate aspect, uh, thanks to councillors like Evan and, and Drew Woolley becoming, uh, Evan and uh, Councillor Farrell, sorry, um, being, uh, being a part of almost every debate. How is this impacting climate? You know, what's the, what's the environmental footprint that, uh, that is going to be, um, that is going to be, kind of realize through this effort. Darren, looking through your crystal ball, what do you think will be the ballot box question on October 18th? Well, it's interesting. Uh, gosh, you really put me on the spot there. Um, I'm gonna go back to something that Evan had said, uh, particularly around the, the provincial politics. Um, depending on how we come out of this, I, I, I don't know, especially for the mayor's chair, I don't know that the uh, ballot question will be a municipal one. I actually think it'll be a provincial one, uh, but, and not necessarily the equalization, um, but the popularity of the, the province. And we, we may be voting with that, that perspective uh, on uh, like with with local candidates, which ones align with the views that I have that are not like the provinces? Uh, because as Evan pointed out, their popularity is at an all time low here in this in the city and in the province right now. Um, so that may turn out to be the biggest ballot box question. 
Um, in terms of municipal issues, though, uh, I think it's definitely going to be uh, the economy and taxation. Whenever you're talking about uh, digging into people's pockets and having a plan for for uh, fixing that or alleviating that, I think that uh, that's what people will probably be voting on. One last question for me, with all the changes in the media and the way people get their news and information, what do you think can be done to better educate the general public and get them the information they need to make informed decisions on important issues? Wow, another big one. Uh, it's like I'm te teaching a media philosophy course here. Um, I think what's really important is, is making sure, uh, I, I'm sure all of us have heard confirmation bias or the term confirmation bias. And I think what's really important, uh, if you really want to understand the issues, is not just to look at the issues from your own perspective. Um, I would challenge everybody to look at the issues from an alternative perspective, at least just to educate yourself on, on why somebody feels the way they do about the Guidebook for Great Communities, why they might feel the way they do about elevating the green line, you know, through the downtown, uh, why, why we have, uh, or, or why we have the downtown strategy, why we have bike lanes. Um, you may not agree with, with everything, but I think it's incumbent upon the voter to not just seek out information that reinforces their own personal beliefs. Um, th that does very little for good civil discourse. Um, and I think that if there's even just one aha moment during the municipal election for people that go, okay, now I understand that having cycle tracks actually has a long-term net economic benefit for everybody in Alberta. Um, okay, I get that. It might actually mean lower taxes for me down the road because we're not paying for certain things. Um, if, if we can have one of those aha moments, just by looking outside of that, that confirmation bias, um, I think that that's probably the best thing that people can do to be educated. I think we're almost out of time. Yeah, I mean, did you, did you have anything, Lucy, or? Well, no, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to share with the audience um, a little bit of information about Darren Krauss. Uh, he is the editor of the Live Wire Calgary, at a, a local and independent daily news organization. He was the managing editor of the Metro newspaper in Calgary for nearly 11 years and doubled up as the editor in the Edmonton for four years. Darren covers Calgary City Hall daily, loves to dig into things, and has covered five municipal elections in his news career in Calgary. So just for the audience to know who Darren is. Thanks very much, Lucy. Thank yeah, you. Th th thanks, thanks so much for, for chatting, Darren. You bet. So we will then, I will press the share screen button again. So. Part three. So let's just talk a little bit about the October election uh, specifically. It is October 18th, uh, <laughs> unlike what the first slide said. Um, not so much about like what the big issues are, but what, what are we actually voting on? Like what, what, what will it be? Because it's actually going to be a little bit different uh, from usual. And then we will uh, talk to Michelle Robinson, get her perspectives about having been uh, a candidate in the, in the past. So here we go. So what's on the on the ballots? So it will actually be a um, a larger number of ballots than than we're used to. So we are obviously voting for city council to vote for mayor and and councilors. Uh, as usual, as well, we'll be voting in school board elections. But then we're, we're going to have two sort of more unusual ones: uh, a couple of referendums. So there will be a provincial referendum uh, about equalization on the same day, um, a municipal referendum about fluoride, potentially more. There's some discussion about. Uh, possibly introducing um, one about uh, a fair deal for um, for Calgary. And then we'll also be talking, uh, voting on uh, in this uh, Alberta Senate nominee election. So let's talk a little bit about what each of these are. So city council election, uh, obviously, um, is, is is sort of the, <laughs> the, the most prominent one in some ways. Um, so obviously, so you as a voter will get to vote for uh, one councillor uh, in, in each of 14 wards. 
if you if you don't know which ward you're in, uh, you can go to uh, help this URL up later, calgary.ca slash election. You can look up uh, which which ward you're voting in. Some of the boundaries have changed this time. So I I think I'm moving from um, ward eight uh, to ward seven in the next election uh, without actually moving even here. Um, is also a citywide vote for mayor. A big difference is there, there are no political parties uh, at, the, at the local level, only really some parts of BC and Quebec actually have political parties uh, locally. Uh, an interesting thing about this election as well is that many incumbent councillors are actually not running for re-election as councillor. Uh, a few of them are, are retiring. Um, there's one vacancy and, and three uh, sitting councillors are currently uh, running for mayor. So, so it's actually, uh, will be a really interesting and kind of more open uh, election in terms of it's actually pretty hard to predict who's going to win in a lot of these uh, places and and who wins really simple system it's it's first past the post so who, basically whoever gets the most votes uh, wins which can be anything from somebody gets 90 percent of the vote if they don't have any um, prominent competitors or maybe sometimes uh, you can win with 25 or 30 percent of the vote if there's lots of different uh, stronger candidates so it's really gonna be uh, uh, pretty interesting. As well, obviously with uh, Mayor Nenshi not running again, it's a, it's a pretty open contest uh, for mayor uh, as well. You also uh, will get a chance to vote in school board elections for either the Calgary Board of Education or the Calgary Catholic School District. Uh, war boundaries are a little bit different. Again, you want, you'll wanna look up where they are if you're not, if you're not familiar, I, I always forget um, which school board uh, wards I'm in. Um, they're, the main role of these elections is to ensure sort of public control uh, of education at the local level, generally less obviously uh, powerful than, than a city council, often a part-time job for many, uh, many of the, uh, the school board trustees. So some of the more unusual or different aspects will be these referenda. So there's one about equalization. There's, they're sort of uh, working out all the details, but it'll be some question like this should section 32 of the constitution act 1982 the constitution uh parliament and the government of canada's commitment to the principle of making equalization payments be removed from the constitution so now i like i'm, I'm not going to specifically answer this question because we don't have another hour but uh, you know what is the equalization so if you look at section 36 2 it's really about the commitment uh of, of the principle of making equalization payments so equalization generally is a, is a federal um, spending program where the federal government makes sure that all the provinces, regardless of their local economic situation, uh, are able to pay for reasonably comparable levels of public service at reasonably comparable levels of taxation. So there's a lot more to unpack there, but again, um, we can't really do that today. But if you do wanna learn more, uh, a couple of recommendations. Uh, the University of Calgary has a great continuing education course called Making Sense of Equalization and Fiscal Transfers in Canada, offered by uh, Dr. Trevor Toom, who's a, an economist at, at the U of C. Uh, if you go to content.ucalgary.ca, uh, you, can, you can register for that course. They're, I think they're offering it twice in the fall. Uh, similarly, I, I do offer a, a, you know, municipal politics or federal politics, provincial politics courses uh, in that same sort of stream. And also, if you're, if you're more of a reader, uh, two relatively recent books. There's The Art of Sharing by Mary Janigan, sort of a more um, historical perspective of the, the development of the equalization system, really great book. Um, if you're more kind of um, <laughs> into more technical detail, um, Fiscal Federalism and Equalization Policy in Canada is a great sort of conversation about the economic and political dimensions of equalization. So really recommend all of these sources uh, if you wanna learn more uh, about the equalization system that, that we'll be voting on in a referendum in the fall. Also, we have this fluoride referendum. So fluoride was, uh, was removed from Calgary's water uh, a few years ago and the referendum uh, could, could reintroduce uh, fluoridation. And again, lots of complicated um, things to think about, but I mean, a fun one is just, this is not our first uh, rodeo, as they might say, with regard to uh, fluoride referendum. We actually had six before, this will be number seven. So it's almost a, a local tradition uh, at this point. So we'll be able to vote uh, there. So if you're looking for a really nice balanced um, source for this, um, the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, part of the University of Calgary, uh, wrote, wrote a great report for City Council in July, 2019. You can Google the name, it comes up. The URL is too complicated to put up. It's a big long one, um, but, it, but it is freely available. Provides you with a good discussion of the pros and cons of, uh, of fluoridation from, from a scientific perspective, but it's a really accessible document. 
I, I, I would recommend uh, looking at that if you're looking for more information uh, about fluoridation. Finally, the Alberta Senate nominee elections. These are held by the provincial government. Primarily, they are meant to act as sort of advice to the prime minister for the nomination of senators. Um, generally speaking, the prime minister basically appoints the Senate, right? Um, it's been changed a little bit in, in the most recent government under, under Justin Trudeau. Uh, they have an independent advisory board for Senate appointments now, but it's still roughly the same kind of process if you just want to think about it as the prime minister appointing the Senate. But Alberta has been holding the Senate elections since the late 80s, I think it was maybe 89 even, where occasionally we will vote on people who the provincial government wants to put forward to the prime minister uh, to appoint to the Senate. There has been some court rulings recently which really complicate this, um, but um, it is a process that we do hold. Uh, we currently, I think, have two vacant Senate seats. The nomination period doesn't yet seem open. Uh, and in the past, some, some of the people who have um, received the most votes in, in, in the nominee elections have been appointed to the Senate, but, but also many have not. So it's a little bit of a sort of a um, contested process, if you want to say. So who can vote then? Uh, basically, if you're 18, a Canadian citizen, resident in Alberta on election day, um, some sort of authorized ID, but there's a really generous uh, interpretation of that. It can include things like attestation if you don't have a physical ID, and basically a neighbor can attest for your um, validity to vote. Um, you can also use some certain types of documents as well. There's a long list on the the city's website. If you, have, if you need more information about this sort of thing or, or the candidates, you can go to calgary.ca slash election, probably the best source uh, that I can recommend. So now I'm gonna invite Michelle Robinson to, to come on board. Hello. Hey, Michelle, how, how's it going? I'm doing great. It was really exciting to hear everybody speak and talk about these issues from their point of view. I just found uh, Evan really inspiring and then you know, talking about uh, transfer payments, I, uh, equalization payments, I, I get a kick out of that conversation every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 so um, really happy that, that you're joining us. Do, do you want to maybe quickly introduce yourself and then we, then we can chat about... Um... Certainly. Oki Naganago Megoche Jestakomaki. My name is Michelle Robinson. I use she and her pronouns. Um, I was really lucky to run in the last election for Ward 10, and I'm super excited to be here and talk about uh, kind of comparing issues that happened before to today. Uh, yeah, long once before uh, COVID-19, there were other issues. So, <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I, I'll, I'll kick it off with a very general question, and then we'll we'll uh, turn it over to the, the audience. But essentially, as as you said, you, you ran uh, you ran last time, and and, yeah. I, and I know people who. Who don't have the opportunity to run or, or, or don't take that chance it's a real mystery uh what the process is like so you want to you want to just sort of talk us through what it was like for you yeah it's really exciting i i've been lucky enough to be a part of political campaigns so i started to learn some terminology and started to understand the lift, uh, different levels of governance and i actually found uh calgary elections website to be really great at kind of walking you through it and actually surprisingly easy and i think today we're seeing uh the ramifications of it being incredibly easy as opposed to um and you know before when it seemed so intimidating but you know as much as people may not like uh, some of the, the mayoral candidates that are running those easy processes is what allowed people like myself who uh, generally face a lot of barriers running to feel comfortable like giving it a try even though it was really scary and but exciting scary that is that feeling like we can do this let's do this yeah so Anyway, I can elaborate, but I'm really worried. I'm going to take up way too much time. So, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, maybe one sort of follow-up question for me, and then, then we'll see, uh, which is just like, you know, if, if you were a person who's never run before and were thinking about it, obviously maybe not so much for this time, but for future elections, is there like one piece of advice you'd like to offer? Well, first, I am going to make a plug for people to consider running in this election, and especially if you're a person who's maybe seeing some of the uh, conversation happening at the school trustee level. I really would love to see, um, you know, both uh, levels of government right there being fully represented by a, a various wide, diverse group of people. So, you know, if you're questioning whether you should run even this time, I would actually encourage you to run. But uh, in, for, for me, I think that bigger picture of, um, you know, consider running. 
everyone should. In fact, um, somebody had said it to me that uh, we talk about civic literacy. If anybody goes to the doors and they, they just do cold door knocking, you will find that the average person actually doesn't really know the different levels of government, their functionality. And so not only should people know that, but I would argue that people should be running at least twice in their lifetime. I had a friend say, just to know who your friends are. But for me, that bigger point of view that uh, it's really important for people to have a, a clearer understanding of the different orders of government and understanding um, what their functionality does so that that way, when you are being critical of a decision that you see, that you have a voice and you, you voice it properly to the different levels of government. and. Uh, it, you know, some of these issues are many jurisdictions, many different orders of government, but for uh, municipal elections specifically, you know, this is a, where your police have a budget, where your uh, first responders in general need your support. So if that is an issue that matters to you, I, I strongly recommend running. Um, but property taxes is a i find a really divisive issue that a lot of people like to think they have an opinion on but i would argue people like uh, trevor toom who uh, dr trevor toom who uh, paul ferry has been regularly referencing that is somebody um you know that can really give us a better breakdown on taxes unless you have an economics degree but even then i don't want people who don't have an economics degree to feel like they should be excluded from the conversation because as we all know, we all have to balance a checkbook, all of us. A lot of us pay our mortgages. And when you're paying your mortgage and city tax and you're not maybe getting um, a pickup that you want to see, maybe it's the compost. I was lucky enough to be in Abbeydale where we did the first pilot. So it's impossible for me to understand how people wouldn't want the compost program when it first rolled out. Um, yeah, I can keep going. So, Paul, please interrupt me. Oh, yeah, no, I, I mean, it, 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 you, 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 you bring in an interesting perspective and I always appreciate it. Um, but I would you. say um, maybe, maybe almost from the opposite point of view. So like having been a candidate now, if I'm a person who wants to volunteer potentially for uh, a campaign or, or like what, what kind of things can volunteers bring to campaigns? Oh, you know, first, every single person um, that runs need your, needs volunteers. We need your energy, number one. Uh, but we also need you to take leadership roles. And when you take those leadership roles in campaigns, you can start to see um, how the dynamics of a campaign work. And then you can start seeing yourself, is this something that I would feel comfortable doing? And then you start making relationships. There are people on that campaign that would get to know you, you get to know them, and maybe they would become a potential campaign or a candidate, or you will, and those are people that you want to align with and start moving forward with. So that way you may run, or you may uh, help maybe Evan Woolley on hit this campaign, but you meet somebody from that campaign who's now running, maybe in a different ward, and that's somebody you want to continue a relationship, or you may feel inspired to run in your ward. And you may have two friends that worked on the same campaign, uh, you know, running in different wards, and then that way you two can come together and talk about these issues. You know, you can work together on city council uh, because you've worked together on campaigns. So I just really, really encourage folks to consider running, um, but also consider uh, going through campaigns first to see the dynamics of a, how a successful campaign works. But uh, the bigger picture too is that you know, even if you lose, it's still worth running because I think it's important to be bringing perspectives to the platforms, the conversations that might not be there that are missing in the bigger dynamic of the conversations that you're hearing through media. Oh, oh and by the way, I wanna give a shout out to Darren. It was really great to have uh, somebody from media come and especially after uh, Evans had spoken about uh, misinformation. Um, you know, feel comfortable challenging misinformation that people actually respond to that. And then you kind of find that people will uh, be gravitated towards you. And I encourage people to really look at some folks that inspire you and consider being a volunteer on their their campaign. No, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, Lucy or Leslie, I wonder uh, if, you have, if you see any questions or have any questions yourself. Mm -hmm. oh, hi, Michelle. Hi, yes, Michelle. actually, we have, hi, we have actually quite a few questions and I know we really press for time, but I just going to take as many as possible as I can. Um, the one question that we have is, doesn't it take a considerable budget to make yourself known in a municipal race? So that comes to funding, right? So even though people might be inclined to run, 
Um, where do they get the funds, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And this is a, a great example where volunteers matter. So, um, you know, part of that uh, running a, a successful campaign is fundraising. And when you have somebody on your team that has some sort of background in fundraising and, and the other thing too, that I had to learn that I wasn't as successful at, which was probably why I didn't get elected is just being open and honest and asking for money. Um, I'm not comfortable doing that, but then I didn't have the budget that I probably should have in order to be more successful. Um, and, and, you know, and the other part is too, I, I, I'm not a big believer that you have to have a huge budget in order to be successful in the sense that I don't want it to stop you from running because the experience is worth it. The, the uh, connections that you make within community is worth it. And uh, the bigger picture is that if, you know, they always, you always hope that you'll inspire the right person to come to your campaign and help with fundraising. But that bigger picture is too, that I, you know, I fundamentally have that belief system that money in politics is part of the problem sometimes too. So uh, it's a different dynamic today with folks having, um, you know, these, these computers in the hands on a regular basis. So I actually would say that even that funding structure that we have towards campaigns can probably start being um, channeled in a different direction towards digital media, you know, in a way to uh, target people. Uh, my area specifically, we have one of the lowest voter turnouts as well. So we have uh, that double dynamic of, you know, how are you really engaging with folks who have so many barriers to even vote in the first place? So there's lots of different um, variables there to think about as compared to maybe some other wards that are very, you know, privileged and have lots of money. Um, you know, I can say at the federal level, our area wasn't uh, an area of influ uh, affluence, sorry, to uh, be bringing in a lot of funding for some of the candidates at different uh, federal or, well, I guess different orders of government in general. So, uh, yeah, I hope that helps. That, that was great. Uh, yes, you. money is very important. It's very difficult to ask for money, right? Mm -hmm. So that's that's a good advice. Um, we do have one more question. This is a little more um, heavy in terms of the uh, topic, but here it is. Uh, so many women are often discouraged from running. And now we are seeing so many women politicians at the federal level leaving politics because of the changes, the challenges of sexism, racism, etc. What do you suggest to women who are running to okay. deal with these issues? Okay, I'm going to say this. Women out there who are listening and, and gender violence in general, so those who may identify as LGBTQ+, you deal already every single day with sexism. If you are racialized like me, you deal every single day with racism. So you're just going to deal with it at a different level. And the block feature is a fabulous feature, uh, just as you would block other people in your life that are sexist, racist, homophobic. You know, these are people that are not your people. And they are, they, um, you know, do what's called like sea lining and trolling in order to drain your energy. But you already deal with that every single day. So my, my uh, and also there are support like nonprofits say like Ask Her, Equal Voice. Uh, there's some uh, black voices to black vote. Um, indigenous folks, we try to support each other the best way we can, but I would argue that there's a bit of an infrastructure and nonprofit lacking there that I would like to work on. Uh, but bigger pictures is that there's usually actually nonprofits that want to support you. I remember in a provincial election recently, there was a LGBTQ2 plus nonprofit that actually talked about who are our candidates, who's who's where should the gay vote go? Where should the gay vote or effort go towards? You know, and, and so there actually are a lot more support networks in place than you may realize. And so, and, and I just encourage women, I encourage anyone who has any sort of intersectionality to just run because, um, you know, I'm, I'm quite blind mm. to ableism. I'm, I'm able-bodied and I forget sometimes about the deaf community, other things. So, you know, that's something I try to really talk about when, when I ran, but also in, in my life in general is that inclusion and what does that really look like? So I have so much I'd love to say, but I know I was pressed for time, but I, my biggest, um, you know, when I, when I was running, we, we were talking about uh, the coalition of municipalities against racism and discrimination. That was such a fun, to, like, there, there are reports available right now to help you kind of even navigate and give you the talking points to move those issues forward. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, how are we doing for time? Do we, have, do we have time for one last question or? I think we could do, we could do one more and then, and then we'll be, then we'll be good too. Sure, okay. I, hope, uh, I hope that answers the question about that. And I hope, 
I hope women and folks with any sort of intersectionality feel comfortable running because this, the, the thing about, you know, white men politics that we've always seen is that it's not going to change unless you run. And that, that was why I ran is because I wanted to make my daughter proud and I did. And that made me happy. And I, I just encourage other folks who, you know, you have legitimate issues that should be talked about. So running gives you that platform to talk about those issues. And I, I want to give a shout out to the Calgary Climate Change Hub. I seen you in there. And that was like, this is, these are people that need to run too, if we're going to be serious about, you know, electric vehicle infrastructure. You know, these were things that I was thinking about. And at the time, uh, cannabis was just legalized. And I, I wanted to be involved in making good infrastructure for that as well. And I'll just keep talking if you don't interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what, you actually answered the question that I wanted to ask, and that was, uh, yeah, what motivates someone to actually run for, um, you know, run for office to fight for certain ideals when this environment is so intimidating, especially for, it's for everybody, right? Like, it doesn't matter what uh, gender or color or, or, it's always an intimidating area, right? A hundred percent. But, I, you know, we all um, we all live in this environment where we're all talking about politics, even if we don't recognize it. And I think that a lot of folks don't recognize how political everything is. Even the paint on the wall is political. The infrastructure that's made for the electrical and house is political. There's nothing that's not political. And uh, so anybody who has uh, an issue, I mean, this is your platform to talk about that. And, uh, you know, it. I know a lot of people say you should run to win. And for me, it was, uh, I, I didn't expect that because I don't get to see Indigenous women in these roles. But for me, it was to hopefully to start changing that dialogue, to hope, hopefully plant the seeds on conversations that are just missing. Because um, I'm saying missing, missing and murdered Indigenous women, violence against women, these are issues that really matter to me. And I don't, I didn't feel I heard that at that level when there were um, things, solutions at that level that could have been implemented, that can be implemented, that aren't being implemented. So please know that whoever you are out there, if you're even thinking about it, you know, um, ask your friends who would help you. Ask your friends who will vote for you. Ask your friends who will volunteer. Ask your friends who would give you money. Because these are things that matter if you're going to run. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Michelle, so you, you are such a role model and inspiration, and I thank you. Um, it just in one answer, <laughs> what's an acceptable <laughs> minimum budget to run for council? Because it's, it's a big barrier in addition to other things. A number. I don't know. 3,000. We'll say 3,000. That's the minimal acceptable amount. And you'd be shocked at how you can do that, really especially with the online digital and, and whatnot going on now. A hundred percent. And, and, and don't let that number even intimidate you because you'll be a surprise once you have some online infrastructure for money, um, it'll come and people will be inspired if for no other reason than to hear you speak. Thanks so much, Michelle. Really, no, really appreciate you joining us. I appreciate being here. Thank you. So maybe well, so uh, one last sort of quick uh, presentation, and then we'll we'll talk to talk to our friend uh, Sarah. So th th it's really the, like the final question of just you know now that you've thought a little bit more and got to know your government, how can you get more involved? Lots of different ways uh, that we'll talk about. Um, so you can get involved in all of these ways: watch council, give your input, voting, volunteering, either for a campaign or for a community association or another civic group. Um, so what does this sort of involve? So if, if, if you've never watched Council before, um, you know, it's, it's, it's good free entertainment at the very least. Um, how to best do that? Uh, you know, obviously read the news, um, but also you can, you can get it really unfiltered yourself. If you go to agendaminutes.calgary.ca, uh, you, you can see what's on the agenda for upcoming meetings. You can see the minutes from past meetings. You can watch video of past meetings. You can watch live. Uh, web coverage uh, of council meetings as well. So that it, it, it is relatively easy um, to, to, to do that in, in more normal times. Um, you can even go to council, um, also fun. You can give your input, lots of different ways as well. Uh, as as Councillor Willie said, you can contact your councillor. Um, many or even all of them are really open to, uh, to that. You can go to engage.calgary.ca, that's another 
um, it's a website that the city uses to gather public input about all sorts of projects. I, I filled out my input about a, a railroad crossing that is, is right by my, uh, by my home and got to tell the city, you know, what kind of things I valued uh, as, as a resident of, of, of the city. You can also present to council. Um, you can sign up there. If you go to that Agenda Minutes uh, website on the city's website, uh, there are instructions for how you can sign up to present to council if there's an issue uh, that's on the agenda uh, that ha has a public hearing uh, that you might want to uh, contribute to uh, as well. And certainly, uh, the bigger diversity of voices that the council gets to hear from, the more they can make decisions that are, you know, for all of the all of the community. Um, as a as a elections nerd, I always like to encourage people to go vote if you're eligible. Um, yeah, just just go vote. It's a, go to the website from earlier. It's really uh, really relatively straightforward. Um, you can volunteer in our campaign, as we just talked about. You know, there'll be a hundred plus campaigns. If you're looking for volunteer opportunities to either share some of your skills or build some new skills, there's lots of work to do uh, for all sorts of campaigns, and they, they will certainly appreciate um, your time and effort. And, and basically, just find a candidate who inspires you, who aligns with your values. Uh, who you know already all, all sorts of uh, ways to choose and finally you can volunteer for a community association or another civic group uh community associations across calgary are uh, um, a really great way to get involved in really low like hyper local issues about your neighborhood about your community they often provide services they they provide advice about local planning they uh, advocate for um your community uh, i mean Personally, I live in, in, in downtown core, like right in the, like the bit with the office towers. Uh, and I've been involved in trying to set up uh, a community association for the downtown core uh, just over the last few months. And, it, and honestly, I would say like the biggest effect for me has been I've met more people who live in my neighborhood as a result of the process of like trying to figure out how to fill out these forms together than I ever had uh, in, 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 uh, in from any other activity. And this is over Zoom. So it's a really great way to, to get to know your neighbors and to, to get involved uh, in your community. So if, you, if you're inspired to, to be involved and be an active citizen, there are all sorts of ways uh, to do this. So now I'm going to invite our uh, final guest, uh, Saroz, to join us. Saroz, you there? I am here. Hello. Welcome. Hello. So do you, want, you, do, do you want to maybe uh, introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is Rose Kunkun. I'm the president of the Whitehorn Community Association. Um, we moved to Calgary from BC probably to, uh, 21 years this year and um, lived in Whitehorn the whole time we've been here. And I've been involved with the community association probably for the previous five or six years. Um, outside of that, um, you know, my involvement doesn't just involve me. We've turned this into a family affair. Um, you know, we've brought up both of our children. Um, our youngest is 14, our oldest is 16 in the community. And, and they're just, you know, and, and they've been just as involved. It's, uh, you know, volunteering uh, has turned into a, it's, it's a lifestyle for us. Um, it's something that we enjoy doing and, and the community is really important um, for us as a family and even for, for bringing up our children. Um, my husband and I, we both grew up in very, very small towns in BC where everybody knew everybody and, and really even living in a big city, we have the opportunity to do that. Um, you know, when we get to know our, when we get to know our community and know who our neighbors are and, and, and know, you know, who, who we can reach out to when we need the help that we do need. For, for sure. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you uh, want to share with us uh, sort of just, just your story of how you became um, active uh, in the community. So I, I'd been involved in, in volunteering, um, you know, just even prior to me coming involved with the community association. Um, you know, we had some great friends, um, you know, my kids were young at this, like they were growing up and uh, it's it's funny how I got involved is I wasn't even at a at an AGM and I got voted in as the treasurer. I had been to a couple of events. Um, they videotaped it and they they came to my house after I had a, a three or four people come by and said, guess who the new treasurer at the Whitehorn Community Association is? And I said, what do you mean? And they're like, well, it's you. 
I said, okay, we'll take on the challenge and we'll, we'll make this work, we'll make this happen. So that is how I got involved um, to start off with. I had attended events there, but, um, but you know, sometimes we, we hesitate to volunteer with organizations. We don't know who to reach out to. We don't know how to, how to reach out. Um, we're afraid to reach out. And it, we don't know, understand how the organization works. So after that, um, you know, obviously being the treasurer at the community association, I needed to know the who, the what, the where, the when, the how, um, you know, how did this work? It was all very new to me. Um, so I, I reached out for help. I reached out for assistance and, and tried to get that ball rolling. Um, initially, you know, there's there's barriers in place. Here was somebody that was coming into this organization that had didn't know the who's who in the zoo. Um, you know, there was a level of trust I needed to establish. There was, um, you know, my brand was important. Um, you know, here they've got somebody barging in as being their treasure, where they've done they've done things certain ways for the previous 20, 15, however many years. So it was so for me to to for 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 me to become a volunteer was very easy, but for me to make sure I persevered through those obstacles that were in my way, um, you know, you often hear we've always done things this way, and you know what? That's not acceptable. Just because we've always done things a certain way doesn't mean we challenge those things. Doesn't mean we talk about those things and we work through those things to improve to make sure that we make this a better place. Um, you know, we, we need to be engaged. If we're not engaged in our communities, they're not for us. Any, any tips for people who maybe want to dip their toe in for the first time into being like a, a volunteering or getting involved in these sorts of activities? Absolutely, Paul. Um, Paul, I think one of the things when we, when we volunteer is, is we need to play to our strengths. Um, you know, don't be afraid to say, I'm not the organizer, I'm not the influencer, but I am the doer. And sometimes when you start off as being the doer, you can turn into that influence and organizer as you're moving into the different roles. Um, you know, observe um, when you start off. And, and, and you know, we, we're, we definitely want to challenge uh, the way things are, but establish your allies, establish your coalition, and then work towards changing it. You don't want to go to your first volunteer event and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Fo don't focus on what's, what's wrong. Focus on the things that the organization is doing well and focus on ways of improvement. Nothing is ever wrong. We can always work on improving the things that, uh, that, we, that we need to do. And my other thing always that I, that I share is, um, you know, volunteering, it's not a sprint. Um, just like a lot of things in life. They're not a sprint, it's a marathon. You need to make sure that when you are volunteering, you can volunteer at a level that you can maintain um, because you don't want to burn yourself out. And volunteers are really, really important. And Paul, I know you'd mentioned earlier that our school boards are often forgot about. I also wanted to say, you know what, I am involved in the community association as well. I've, I've been involved with the school councils um, throughout my kids growing up. And one of the things is, is we really, really, um, it's really important for parents to step up even in our school councils. It's important for citizens to step up into our community associations. We often hear that we don't like this or this isn't right or we're not being listened to, but you need to be involved in order to make sure you are listened to and your voices are heard. And if you can't be involved, then, then find the people because I can say to you that I used to be a person that might say, hey, I'm not being heard, but I can tell you now, when you know the right people to reach out to, you might not always get the outcome you want, but at least you get an explanation to why it is the way it is. I'm curious, Leslie or Lucy, if, if, you, if you have any questions. Yes, hi, Soros, how are you? Uh, good, Leslie, uh, how are you? Excellent. Um, you, you brought up the notion of there's other groups out there as well that need uh, volunteers and that all of these, there's various ways to have impact on a city. Talking about the community association specifically, um, how might uh, a community association or the network of 152 community associations uh, get council, city council to be more engaged at uh, a community association level and, and, you know, really embrace the role of a community association and how they can mobilize people. 
So I think, Leslie, one of the things for, for City Council to be more involved in community associations, it really goes back to our councillors that we have in our wards. It's very, very important for them um, to, to, to be at our meetings. And, and, and I know at ours, we do, we do have representation to take that feedback that we're providing and make sure they're closing the loop. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've sat up in meetings in both where, A, we've had somebody that's absolutely phenomenal in closing the loop for us. And we've also had opportunities Opportunities where we can't get that loop closed and and it's almost we're going we continually go back and say we would like an answer we would like an answer but I think when we when we work together as even community associations and we work with our counselor to have our voices heard that is the best way that that the council can be involved with us we're also here for feedback um, you know, we can we can gather the troops to get get the feedback that is needed. Um, you know, when we have events, we can once again gather the troops. And I think the other piece for councillor uh, for for our for our council and and our mayor and and other elected officials is show up at our events. Um, you know, show up at our events, be a part of them, um, because at the end of the day, uh, you know, you are citizens just like we are, and it's very important for you to be there and hear what your peers, what the community has to say and what their feedback is. Take that feedback and help us out in any way that you can. Soros, I know that there's barriers to volunteering and barriers to running for, for office. And I guess, um, you know, as you think about uh, people wanting to join either the, the school uh, council, the parent council, or the community association, or a local a bike club or climate hub, or, you know, an organization, a, a cultural organization, uh, but they feel there is barrier or they've experienced barrier. And, and what advice would you give them to help them uh, kind of just persevere as you have, but some advice. So I'm going to go back to what Michelle said. We deal with it. We deal with barriers on a, uh, on a daily basis um, for myself, um, you know, uh, you know, we've, we've got our cultural barriers and, and we deal with them out in the community, but we also deal with these barriers in the house. And I often say that, you know what, we need to be an advocate for ourselves. We need to make sure that, you know, we need to step outside of our comfort zone in order for us to grow as individuals as well. So when you, when you are, when, you know, when dealing with these barriers, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Now, with that being said, you know, we always need to make sure you know, we are being respected, but, you know, being a woman, being, um, you know, being East Indian myself, I, I've dealt with those barriers, but I think the biggest thing I had is have is, um, you know, just, just do it, just try it out. You'll, and, and, and you know what, don't give up on the first time, keep doing it because at the end of the day, I promise it is rewarding. And, and I felt those rewards. And I know even for my own mental health, I work from home, but from my own mental health, my volunteering is what keeps me sane and safe. And, and stable. Excellent. Um, what is the, I guess, the biz, biggest uh, success or the thing you're most proud of? Uh, and, you know, you kind of fell into the community association's role as treasurer, now as president. What's, what's your biggest achievement? Leslie, I think um, my biggest achievement, and again, it's not an individual achievement because achievements are made so much more successful through the teams that we work with and the teams that we lead. Um, I think our my biggest uh, one of my biggest achievements is is currently our board. Um, that's our our board and our volunteers we have with the Whitehorn Community Association. So five years ago, when we take a look at the dynamics of our board, it's very different from what we have today. Um, I think if we take a snapshot of our board and we take a snapshot of our community around us, our board very very much um, is 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 an example. It's a symbol of who our community is. So we've brought together, um, you know. We, there's women on it, there's men on it, there's, there's some, there's some, you know, there's people in their 20s, there's people in their 40s, there's people in their 70s. So we've got all those walks of life that are represented on it. And by having that board, one of our biggest things that we've managed to do is we've managed to bring our community together. Um, you know, and I think that's, that's one of the biggest things. And, and even prior to me being there, I think our community was brought together, but it, it's now coming together in different ways. I think people are more comfortable in coming out. People are more comfortable in speaking. Um, you know, we're, we, we, we know who our neighbors are a little bit more maybe than what we did four or five years ago. So I think one of my biggest successes that I'm truly proud of, it's just how the dynamics has changed to represent more of what we are as a community. 
and, and so important to have an inspired leader, um, you know, supporting teams to be inclusive and welcoming, no matter what kind of organization uh, you're leading, is to help uh, reduce the barriers to participation. Mm-hmm. Because uh, they all tie back into, uh, in, in a lot of ways, into our political structures as well. So uh, thank you, Soros. Uh, I don't know if Lucy has a question coming up, uh, but I think that um, kind of been, oh, I do have some more, but you go ahead, Lucy. Um, well, just one quick question because we're running out of time here. But a question is if someone has a, um, a younger adult in their family who is about to vote for the first time this fall. Uh, do you have any idea how to get them interested? How to get youth interested? Yeah. How to so get I have interested in voting. Absolutely. Um, so Leslie, I just wanted to, you know, being inclusive, um, one of the things I just wanted to say, uh, add on to that first question, Lucy, and I'll get to yours as well, um, is remember everybody has different strengths and I often hear this is we need to play to people's strengths because I will also often have a volunteer that shows up and somebody else says well they can't do this and they can't do this and I said well let's find them something they can do and we have you know it's not only about being inclusive to cultures but it's people have physical limitations and, and we really need to make sure that that we even look after those people in a volunteering organization but Lucy when you're when you're talking about um your, your question about youth. So I have a 14 and a 16 year old. Um, and I know one of our biggest successes um, with, with, you know, they can't vote yet, but one of our biggest successes is even getting them out there. Um, you know, making sure that they're aware of who the leaders are in our community, um, making sure they're reaching out, um, you know, helping them with their school and saying, and when they have a question, don't tell them to go to Google. Don't answer that question for them. You know, who do you think, ask them the open-ended questions of who do you think would be the best person to answer that question for you? Allow them to grow and allow them to seek the help that they need. So I know even when my son has come to me and it's, it's a question about government or something, and he's like, well, mom, I don't know about this one. And I've always said, well, who's the best person? And he might say, it's this counselor, or mayor might have the answer, or, or MLA might have the answer, or MP might have the answer. I encourage them, reach out. And you know, they might reach out with an email and then a couple days later, I don't have an answer, call them. And there have been times where I've grabbed the phone myself and said, you know what, you want youth to be involved. Part of your platform was that you wanted youth leadership and you've got youth reaching out to you and you're not reaching back out to them. Can you help me understand that? And I think as parents, we need to be advocates for our children and we also need to be advocates for the system for our children. Thank you. I don't have any more questions. I guess I'll make one last point, which is just about voting. If you if you want youth to become voters, one of the most interesting bits of political science research is actually as much as voting is a responsibility and a duty and a way to be a good citizen and all of this sort of thing, it's also a habit. So people who vote the first three times that they're eligible to vote become voters for life. So if you can support youth in your life who are early on in their voting, um, voyage, um, it's really, really worth a lot in terms of uh, making people into lifetime voters. Thank you. Um, We are almost out of time. So any more questions, any closing remarks that anyone wants to to share? Thank you, Saros. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I mean, all I would say is is, is thanks so much to all, all of the, the panelists and, and the attendees for, for coming today. It's always uh, really important and personally very rewarding to to talk about uh, community and, and, and how to make our community better. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you to the audience for taking the time in their busy day to join us on a Saturday morning. Uh, big thank you to Paul for guiding us through this uh, session. And thank you to our speakers, our guest speakers, uh, Councillor Woolley, Darren Krause, Michelle Robinson, and Saros Kunkun. Um, thank you for sharing your experiences and insights. Um, I also would like to thank, to thank all the other volunteers that were working behind the scenes to make this happen. 
And I'm asking the audience to please take a few minutes, 10 seconds of your time before you sign off to fill out that three question survey. Um, we really would like to have your feedback and we want to understand if this session was useful for you. I would like to thank again, uh, the Calgary Foundation and the Friends of the Federation for their financial support. We look forward to having you back for two more sessions. Get to know your government, provincial and federal. Watch for information closer to these elections. Thank you very much and enjoy your weekend. Thanks everybody.